Gentlemen, let's broaden our minds. Lawrence. Shazam! is an NBC Saturday morning cartoon produced by Filmation Studios in the year 1981. Each week, Billy Batson, star reporter for Wiz Radio, would say the magic word Shazam! and transform into the heroic Captain Marvel to battle his greatest villains. Typically, the station is named Wiz Radio, W-H-I-Z, after the comic title Captain Marvel first appeared in called Wiz Comics. However, for some reason on the Filmation series, they refer to the station as W-I-Z-Z, so now they have a call sign that looks like a word a little kid would use to describe someone urinating. The Perry White to Billy Batson's Clark Kent, Sterling Morris, owned and operated radio station WIZ, and first appears inside the pages of the premiere issue of Wiz Comics from the year 1939. Artist CeCe Beck has said that he based the visual design of Morris on actor Gene Lockhart. I can't bear to watch anymore! While Filmation introduced kids all over America to Captain Marvel with their live-action Shazam! TV series, this animated series brought Captain Marvel's entire family to the Saturday morning lineup. While elements of the character Mentor from the live-action Filmation Shazam! series were grafted upon to Billy Batson's Uncle Dudley for a time, typically Dudley is a lovable charlatan who goes by the name Uncle Marvel. Uncle Marvel makes his first appearance inside the pages of WoW Comics, issue number 18 in the year 1943. He later meets Captain Marvel himself within the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures, issue 43 in the year 1944. Unlike Captain Marvel, Uncle Marvel can not transform into a superhero by calling out the wizard Shazam's name. Instead, he is content to quick change into a similar costume and join Captain Marvel on his adventures. This situation calls for Uncle Marvel. I guess. Shazam! The first post-crisis iteration of Uncle Dudley came in the four-issue miniseries Shazam! The New Beginning. Eager to strip the oxymoronic nature of a well-meaning, albeit pretend uncle, Roy and Dan Thomas reimagine Uncle Dudley as Dudley Batson, Billy's true blood uncle in the 1987 miniseries. Similar to the cartoon episode Flight 601 Has Vanished, where we see Uncle Dudley entertaining the kids with his magic act, in Shazam! The New Beginning, Dudley Batson's chosen profession is that of a stage magician. Thank you, thank you! And now, for my final turret! However, this reimagining did not stand the test of time, and in the subsequent post-crisis retelling in the year 1994, Dudley H. Dudley is the custodian at Billy's Middle School in the Power of Shazam graphic novel by Jerry Ordway. While Billy Batson confides in a blood uncle that he is Captain Marvel in Shazam The New Beginning, he accidentally reveals his secret to his middle school janitor inside the pages of Power of Shazam issue number four in the year 1995. By the end of that year, within the pages of Power of Shazam issue number 11, the sorcerer Ibis grants Dudley actual magical powers to aid the Marvel family as Uncle Marvel. Between the two versions, I think I prefer the stage magician who is Billy Batson's uncle by blood to the drunk lush of a janitor who makes deals with werewolves to have people killed to save his own skin. Uncle Dudley, huh? That 
looks like one doofus who'd be easy to bamboozle. Uncle Super, an evil alternate version of Uncle Marvel, would appear in the animated feature Justice League Crisis on Two Earths in the year 2010. In 2011, the Young Justice episode Alpha Male has Captain Marvel telling his Uncle Dudley about his adventures with the team before transforming back into Billy Batson and heading to bed. Uncle Dudley would go on to make a cameo appearance in a later episode titled Misplaced. Thanks to a spell cast by Clarion the Witch Boy and other dark magicians, they create parallel realities where children like Billy Batson were separated from their adult family like Uncle Dudley. In the year 2017, Dudley H. Dudley travels with Billy Batson in an RV in the Justice League action episode titled Captain Bamboozle, calling back to the Filmation live-action TV series. Former Riddler John Astin would provide the vocal talents for Uncle Dudley. When Mr. Mitzelplick poses as the ancient wizard, Dudley H. Dudley is able to transform into a super-powered Captain Bamboozle by saying the magic word BAMBOOZLE. Although he means well, Dudley causes mischief more often than not, as Mr. Mitzelplick intended. I know what I'll do. I'll use my food power, then my muscle power, then I'll finish him off with my incredible power of guilt of Zixum. What? There is no power of guilt of Zixum! Oh, you made me say it. Freckles Marvel is introduced within the pages of WoW Comics, issue number 35, in the year 1945. Also known as Mary Dudley, she is revealed to be the niece of Uncle Dudley and made frequent appearances in her cousin Mary Marvel's title throughout its 28-issue run. In the comics, she's portrayed as a wild tomboy who would just as soon beat the crap out of a boy chess champion when he tells her she's too dumb to play the game and reminds me of one of her contemporaries, the character Pippi Longstocking. On the Filmation animated series, when Freckles comes to visit her cousins Mary and Billy, they play up her cuteness factor, and she comes across like Baby Doll from Batman the Animated Series, only without any tragic backstory. Well done, Freckles. You're a real marvel. <laughs> Mr. Takitani makes his first appearance inside the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 79 in the year 1947. Ultimately, Tawny takes up his first profession as a novelty tour guide at the Natural History Museum. Tawny was popular enough to make a cover appearance on Captain Marvel Adventures, issue number 82, later that year. It reveals that an old hermit experimented on Tawny with a serum that gave him the powers of speech. In the episode titled The Circus Plot, written by Paul Dini of Batman the Animated Series fame, Mr. Taki Tawny auditions to become part of Colonel Beauregard Jason's circus. Oh, I thought perhaps I'd recite some Shakespeare. <laughs> or maybe a little Kipling. In Captain Marvel Adventures, issue 119 from the year 1951, Tawny takes on a second job as a door-to-door -door salesman. And despite his ignorance of being scammed by Honest John, who sells Tawny faulty goods, helps Captain Marvel bring the swindler to justice. Tawny then goes on to become a baseball player for the Detroit Tigers in Shazam! issue number 32 from the year 1977. Just as the character of Orko from He-Man and the Masters of the Universe owes a lot to Filmation's Batmite, I think Prince Adam's pet Cringer owes a great deal to Filmation's Mr. Talkie Tawny. In the episode titled Who's Who at the Zoo, Mr. Talkie Tawny holds the occupation of the director of the Fawcett City Zoo. As zoo director, Tawny is shown talking to caged tigers. Oh, the irony. This is worse than I expected. But what does Alarog want? What do you want? In his post-crisis reinterpretation, Tawny is a stuffed animal that belonged to a young Mary Batson before she was orphaned in the Power of Shazam graphic novel from the year 1994. By the following year, inside the pages of the Power of Shazam issue number 4, the stuffed animal sometimes takes the appearance of a personified tiger that ends up talking with both Billy Batson and Mary Bromfield. Initially, the kids believe the old wizard, Shazam, is using the stuffed animal as a conduit to speak to them within the 
pages of The Power of Shazam issue number 9. However, Tawny is later revealed to be a harmless puka inside the pages of Power of Shazam issue number 11. A puka is a term from Irish folklore that typically refers to a shapeshifter that can take any form it chooses. Traditionally, they take the shapes of animals who have the power of human speech. They love to chat and will happily stop and shoot the breeze with you as Mr. Tawny often does with Dudley H. Dudley in the Power of Shazam comic book. Tawny is frequently also seen palling around with Uncle Dudley in the Filmation animated series as well. Gee, you marbles are all right. You're, you're great. Tony, tell the folks how Frosted Flakes taste. Great! When he's not acting like the tiger mascot for Frosted Flakes cereal, Mr. Tawny would go on to make appearances as the stuffed animal of Mary Bromfield, or Mary Batson, in the episodes titled The Power of Shazam and the Malicious Mr. Mind on Batman the Brave and the Bold in the year 2010. In the very same year, Talkie Tawny appears in the climax of the animated feature Superman Shazam The Return of Black Adam. Tawny would next appear as a genetically enhanced Bengal tiger that Captain Marvel frees from the Brain and Monsieur Mala's mind control collars in the Young Justice episode titled Alpha Male in the year 2011. In the Shazam backup strip inside the pages of Justice League issue number 10 from the year 2012, Tawny is simply a tiger at the zoo who Billy Batson feeds hamburgers. However, by the climax of the story in Justice League issue number 21, the tiger is imbued with the powers of Shazam. In the year 2014, the anthropomorphic version of Mr. Talkie Tawny makes an appearance in the DC Nation short Shazam segment titled Stamina. While we have yet to see a live action Talkie Tawny, there are plenty of nods to the character in the 2019 feature film Shazam. You may not have noticed this, but when Billy transforms into Shazam, the faces of tigers are etched into the golden discs that secure his cape. In addition, there is an iron-on patch of a tiger head on Billy Batson's green backpack. Shazam also hands a stuffed animal tiger to a little girl hiding with her father during the battle between himself and Savannah at the Winter Carnival. Bring back, bring back, bring back my tawny to me, to me. Bring back, bring back, bring back my tawny to me. Captain Marvel Jr. is a regular staple of the Filmation cartoon, always appearing side by side with his namesake, Captain Marvel. In the second appearance of Captain Nazi, inside the pages of Wiz Comics issue number 25 from the year 1941, the vile villain kills the grandfather of the young boy named Freddy Freeman. Captain Nazi very nearly would have killed Freddy if not for the timely intervention of one Captain Marvel. However, the nurses at the hospital think Freddy's broken back will disable him for life and that he will not even make it through the night. At that point, Billy Batson transforms into Captain Marvel, and like the ancient wizard Shazam, bestows some of his own power onto Freddy. Now, when Freddy Freeman calls out his idol's name, Captain Marvel, he will transform into Captain Marvel Jr. While the show intro gives viewers the basics on Freddy Freeman transforming into Captain Marvel Jr., the story behind Freddy's disability is never actually covered on Saturday morning cartoon fair. The third member of the mighty trio is their friend, lame newsboy Freddie Freeman. When he speaks the name of his idol, Captain Marvel! Freddie becomes the powerful Captain Marvel Jr. It's worth noting that the Fawcett stable of characters had quote-unquote comic awareness way before characters like She-Hulk or Deadpool made it super cool. Captain Marvel, who headlined Wiz Comics, tells Freddy he'll be sending him over to Master Comics, and sure enough, when Captain Marvel Jr. arrives to aid Bullet Man, he tells him, Just got over from Wiz Comics. He was immediately placed into his own feature in the pages of Master Comics, issue 23, that same year, which ran up until the book's conclusion in 1953. In the year 1942, Captain Marvel Jr. was popular enough to headline his own title, which ran for 119 issues. It can be quite easy to take the members of the Marvel family for granted, seeing as how they appear in every episode. It's not like Star Trek The Next Generation, where each member of the supporting cast will receive an episode exclusively featuring a supporting character as the lead of the episode. If I had to point out a few episodes, 
episodes where Freddie Freeman and Captain Marvel Jr. have a bit more of the spotlight. They'd be Flight 601 has vanished and a little something extra. In both episodes, the plot focuses on missing members of the Marvel family, which gives newsboy Freddie Freeman and Captain Marvel Jr. some individual focus just for a little while. Moron, Mr. Mind, why didn't he remind me about Captain Marvel Jr.? The post-crisis reintroduction of Freddie Freeman within the pages of Power of Shazam, issue number 6, in the year 1995, basically retells Freeman's origin story. The modern, updated context mostly focuses on Captain Nazi being revived from suspended animation, and both Billy and Mary sharing their powers with Freddie so he can transform into Captain Marvel Jr. within the pages of Power of Shazam, issue number 7. In 1996, Captain Marvel Jr. makes a guest appearance in issues 4 and 5 of the Teen Titans book of the day. And by issue number 17 from the following year, he was a full-fledged member of the team. Infamously, in the year 1998, inside the pages of The Power of Shazam, issue number 37, titled A CM3 Adventure, he begins going by the name CM3 with the reasoning that he needs a code name he can actually say without inadvertently summoning the magic lightning. Later in Teen Titans issue number 20, while on a date with his teammate Argent, he tells her, My friends call me CM3. And inside the pages of The Power of Shazam issue number 38, there is even more exposition and explanation that rationalizes the name change as standing for Captain Marvel 3, or third in line behind Billy and Mary for The Power of Shazam. My favorite take on the character is seeing Freddie Freeman take on the mantle of Captain Marvel in the Trial of Shazam maxi-series. The 2006 12-issue maxi-series from Judd Winnick of the Real World fame really seemed to tap into the Narnia and Harry Potter zeitgeist of the time. This is a false headline. It's a phony. Why would somebody go through all the trouble to print it up? You can bet I'll find out. While historians may agree to disagree if Captain Marvel Jr. was actually Elvis Presley's favorite comic book to read, or if he played a role in the look of his concert jumpsuits, there is certainly something to the legend that a six-year-old Elvis may have been inspired by the heroes of his youth. I read comic books and I was the hero of the comic book. I saw movies and I was the hero in the movie. So every dream that I ever dreamed has come true a hundred times. According to Pamela Clark Keough's Elvis Presley, The Man, The Life, The Legend, Elvis used comics as an escape. He read comic books and was drawn to Superman, Batman, and most of all, Captain Marvel Jr. Around the age of 12, Elvis discovered Captain Marvel Jr. and quickly became almost obsessed with him. Elaine Dundee's book, Elvis and Gladys, The Genesis of the King, also points to Elvis's lifelong friend, Billy Smith, to support the notion that the King idolized both Freddie Freeman and Captain Marvel Jr. One of the comics Elvis read when he was a kid was Captain Marvel Jr. He went after Captain Nazi during World War II, and he had this dual image, normal, everyday guy, and super crime fighter. Sounds like Elvis, don't it? Apparently, Elvis's childhood collection of comic books is supposed to sit in the attic at his Graceland estate in Memphis, Tennessee, but since they don't let visitors on the second floor, much less in the attic, who is to say? At some point, a copy of Captain Marvel Jr. issue number 51 would sit on the dresser in the recreation of his childhood room at Memphis's Lauderdale Court's housing complex. This was shown in the now defunct Dial B for Blog website around 2006, however that issue must have been sold off or stolen or something because the oldest video tours I've found from 2011 only have some Johnny Hazard, Dick Tracy, Roy Rogers, and Lone Ranger comic books. The King of rock and roll would later return the favor, inspiring the character design for an adult version of Captain Marvel Jr. known as King Marvel in the DC Comics series title Kingdom Come. In the story Twilight of the Teen Titans from issue number 23 from the year 2005, Captain Marvel Jr. is shown to be an Elvis Presley fanboy. He even quotes Elvis saying, Do what's right for you as long as you don't hurt no one. And calls the king the greatest modern day philosopher. Clarence, I like you. I always have. Always will.
In the year 2010, Captain Super Jr. of the Crime Syndicate, an evil mirror of Captain Marvel Jr., appears in the direct-to-video animated feature Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Freddie Freeman and Captain Marvel Jr. are featured in The Batman, The Brave and the Bold episode titled The Malicious Mr. Mine from the year 2011. A blonde Freddie Freeman would be reintroduced yet again in the year 2012 as part of DC Comics' New 52 initiative. His first appearance is within the Shazam! backup strip inside the pages of Justice League issue number 8 from the year 2012. In the year 2013, Freddie Freeman takes his place as a member of the Shazam family within the pages of Justice League issue number 21. Unfortunately, since he can no longer legally be called Captain Marvel Jr., I believe the officially licensed name for the character is now Shazam Jr. In the year 2013, Freddie Freeman can be seen along with other Shazam family kids in the direct-to-video animated feature Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox. The following year, Freddie Freeman makes a cameo appearance in the direct-to-video animated feature Justice League War. Freddie Freeman would go on to make his first live-action appearance in the 2019 feature film Shazam. He too gains his own heroic identity when the Wizard's champion has his foster siblings, including Freddie, touch the Wizard's staff in order to share the power of Shazam. A few months prior to the release of the feature film led to some corporate synergy where Freddie is regularly featured as Shazam Jr. in the ongoing DC Universe Shazam title. What is the secret of old Shazam? That's it! What? That word! Shazam? Mary Marvel also frequently appears side by side with Captain Marvel on the Filmation cartoon. Mary Marvel is Billy Batson's long lost twin sister, who makes her first appearance in Captain Marvel Adventures, issue number 18 in the year 1942. When Mary Batson says the magic word, Shazam, she transforms into the heroine Mary Marvel. On the television series, Mary Marvel's abilities are said to come from The grace of Selena with the best qualities of other goddesses. Which I always used to think was pure cockamamie as a kid, and it really ticked me off because I thought Filmation couldn't be bothered to come up with the respective goddesses that make up the wizard's name Shazam. However, if you look at her comic book origins, you'll see there are actually other goddesses. Selena, goddess of the moon for grace. Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons for strength. Adriani, spirit of skill for skill. Zephyria, spirit of the west wind for fleetness. Aurora, goddess of the dawn for beauty. Minerva, goddess of wisdom for wisdom. Hakamami, he calls it? Tisk, tisk. <laughs> On her deathbed, Nurse Sarah Prim calls for Billy Batson to tell him of the sister he never knew he had. Born twins, young Mary was placed with the well-to-do Bromefield family, whose baby daughter suddenly died. Prim substituted Mary Batson for the Bromfield's dead child. Before Prim passes away, she leaves Billy one half of a broken locket, which ultimately leads him to his twin sister who goes by the name Mary Bromfield. I guess that Mary's status as a member of a wealthy family could even be a no prize for why the trio have a Marvel mansion on the television series. World's Finest Comics, issue 255 in the year 1978, makes mention of and shows Mrs. Bromfield, Mary's foster mother, at the suburban Bromfield Mansion. Later, there are also references to the Bromfield home in World's Finest Comics, issue 256, where Mary Batson lives with her foster mother, and World's Finest Comics, issue 261, reiterates her status as Mary Batson, adopted daughter of the wealthy Mrs. Bromfield. Mary Marvel took on a feature of her own, starting in WoW Comics, issue number 9 in the year 1942, that would last until issue number 58 in the year 1947. Mary Marvel receives her very own title in the year 1945, and the book ran for 28 issues before being converted into a Western comic, Monty Hale Western, in the year 1948. Hey, don't go away. The fun's just starting. Again, while the series didn't traditionally have episodes to showcase each member of the Marvel family, one of the standout moments for Mary Marvel takes place in the episode titled A Little Something Extra. When a fake newspaper story declares that Captain Marvel has gone missing, it's up to Mary and Freddy to track down the culprit behind the false headline. Mary Marvel gets the idea to call upon the elders, much like the live-action Billy Batson used to do on the television series, though Mary appears to be able to do so without using 
the Eternophone. O oh, elders fleet and strong and wise, appear before our seeking eyes. We hear you, Mary. Mary Batson makes her first post-crisis appearance as a child within the pages of the Power of Shazam graphic novel from the year 1994. When we last see her, Mary Batson is left in the care of Theo Adam, the man who killed her parents. The following year, going by the name Mary Bromfield, she appears as a teenage girl accompanied by her nanny, Miss Prim, inside the pages of The Power of Shazam, issue number three. When Billy Batson gives Mary Bromfield her talky tawny stuffed animal, the puka tells her to say the magic word, Shazam, and she transforms into Mary Marvel for the first time within the pages of The Power of Shazam, issue number four. In the same issue, Miss Prim takes a bullet meant for Mary Marvel and reveals she is the the sister of Theo Adam, and took it upon herself to raise Mary after her brother's heinous actions. Unfortunately, with her death, Nanny Prim suffers in Hades under the thumb of Superman villainous Blaze inside the pages of Power of Shazam issue number 5. However, by Power of Shazam issue number 12, from the year 1995, Sarah Prim is freed from Blaze's underworld by Mary Marvel with the aid of her own brother, Lord Satanus himself. One of the exemplary story arcs in the Power of Shazam series ran from issues 25 to issue 27. Taking cues from the classic film It's a Wonderful Life and the first Batman from Detective Comics issue 235, Jerry Ordway crafts an alternate timeline where Clarence Charles and Marilyn Batson are not slain. Instead, the parents are now the wizard Shazam's champions with their own unique costumes and attire. This is also important because it marks the first appearance of Mary Marvel's white variant costume, which is initially worn by her mother, Marilyn Batson, inside the page of Power of Shazam, issue number 25, from the year 1997. Once all is said and done, with C.C. Batson and Wave Rider correcting the timeline, the one lasting change from the event is that Mary Marvel would switch to wearing the white variant costume as of Power of Shazam, issue number 28, later that year. Mary Marvel's white variant costume would even show up in Wave 12 of Mattel's DC Universe Classics line of action figures in the year 2010. Switch on! Switch on! One, two, switch! Regrettably, there seemed to be some kind of perverse and twisted desire to corrupt and, dare I say, defile Mary Marvel. This seems to have started with a pitch from Alan Moore that never saw the light of day called Twilight of the Superheroes, a dystopian future where superhero dynasties clash for power. Among those dynasties would be the House of Thunder, which would see Captain Marvel Sr. and Mary Marvel Sr. married Game of Thrones style. Meanwhile, Moore reveals Captain Marvel Jr and Murray Marvel are having an affair without the knowledge of Captain Marvel, the same style of Guinevere and Lancelot, which will cause consequences as terrible as were the Arthurian legends. According to the modern master's books from Two Moros Publishing, originally in formerly known as the Justice League, Keith Giffen wanted to do a gag where during the course of the miniseries, Mary Marvel would lose her virginity and would go from the pure white costume to the red version. Eventually, actual post-crisis publications from DC Comics would see Mary Marvel denigrated even further. Peter David intended to have Mary Marvel get sexually harassed and almost molested by a police officer in the Supergirl plus Mary Marvel special in the year 1997. The actual story turned out a lot more ambiguous. There's a whole he said, she said vibe about it, which almost makes it worse. Later in the same Supergirl series in 2002, Mary Marvel becomes a co-star for an arc and is stabbed to death with a demon dagger for her troubles. She eventually gets better, but it's a gruesome sight to behold. DC's countdown to Final Crisis in the year 2007 would see her take on the powers of Captain Marvel's greatest villain, Black Adam, after losing her powers when the wizard Shazam dies in the Day of Vengeance miniseries. Before you know it, Black Mary becomes more and more aggressive, taking on her fellow heroes and doing favors for Darkseid himself. 
However bad people believe Countdown was, it was almost preferable to what was to come in Grant Morrison's Final Crisis the following year. Although Mary Marvel having a dark turn was just explored in the aforementioned Countdown Weekly series, she becomes possessed by the new god of Apocalypse Desaad. Now, a giggling sadomasochist who has more in common with the current pigtailed interpretations of Harley Quinn than Judy Garland, she tells Black Adam, Hit me again. As she moans in ecstasy. I felt like destroying something beautiful. I'd also like to say, given the recent penchant for calling Captain Marvel Shazam, which is the wizard's name, there have been some extremely awkward attempts to transpose that nomenclature onto Mary Marvel. I mean, who at DC Licensing thinks that the name Mary Shazam is a good idea? Mary Shazam? Are you serious? If I might suggest, there is always the far more preferable Lady Marvel from Kingdom Come, and I have seen that modified to the equally preferable Lady Lady Shazam. Come on guys, it's not that hard. If it can't be Mary Marvel for legal reasons, say it with me. Lady Shazam. What I was going to ask is what took you so long? One element I find fascinating about Mary Marvel is that she kind of heralds an environment where the Marvel family's secret identities become null and void. The Marvel family, originally comprised of Captain Marvel, Captain Marvel Jr., Mary Marvel, and Uncle Marvel, would first appear in Marvel Family issue number one in the year 1945. Mary Marvel not really having a secret identity predates a lot of the current fad examples of superheroes discarding their secret identities in comic books. Prior to Mary Marvel, you could argue that Billy Batson and Captain Marvel would be difficult to associate with one another. One's a grown man and the other one's an orphan child. Although Savannah is fully aware of Billy Batson being the Big Red Cheese, in Power of Shazam, issue number 17, Savannah flat out tells Captain Marvel he wouldn't give away his secret. If I ever gave it away, it would be of no value to me. <laughs> Even Freddie Freeman's disability distinguishes him from Captain Marvel Jr. in body, if not in facial features. Maybe it's my own personal headcanon influenced by her appearance in the Filmation animated series, but with the few exceptions being Jerry Ordway's post-crisis take on Mary in The Power of Shazam, and the recent Shazam feature film from 2019, having Mary played by Grace Fulton as a teenage girl and Lady Shazam played by Michelle Borth as an adult hero, most interpretations of Mary Marvel are I've seen have a cute face that is virtually indistinguishable from Mary Batson. Even when both Billy and Mary were portrayed as extremely young in Jeff Smith's Shazam and the Monster Society of Evil, while Billy became an adult as Captain Marvel, Mary Marvel retained her childlike size and body. Mary Marvel's one-for-one -one face, from Mary Batson to Mary Marvel, probably accounts for the influence as well as the incredulous disbelief when it comes to Filmation's Prince Adam and He-Man maintaining a secret identity. The Marvel family's secret identities were usually well well known to the villains on the series and the comic books, otherwise they wouldn't constantly tie them up and insta-gag them to prevent them from speaking out their magic transformation phrases. Welcome to my humble laboratory, Marvels. Would you like me to loosen your gag so you can say your last words? Other animated appearances begin with Mary Marvel's guest appearance on the Superpower Hours sister show to Shazam, Hero High. As mentioned in my series of Archie videos, Hero High was Filmation's attempt to retool the Archie gang superheroes into their own unique characters. In the episode, Girl of His Dreams, Mary Marvel visits Hero High as a guest lecturer. She mentors the gang and helps them convince the Reggie Mantle analog, Rex Ruthless, not to drop out of Hero High when he fears he's lost his superpowers. In the year 2010, two characters could possibly be an evil mirror of Mary Marvel in the direct-to-video animated feature Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. The late great writer of the film, Dwayne McDuffie, left comments on the comic book resources forums indicating that Superwoman is indeed a Mary Marvel analog. Her three main made men are all Lieutenant Marvels. Note that their costumes all match. And if you're convinced that Superwoman should be the evil version of Wonder Woman, McDuffie goes on to clarify. Later in the story, Wonder Woman fights Olympiad, intended as a Wonder Woman analog. 
However, another option is a character that appears on a monitor screen whom character designer for the film Jerome K. Moore identifies as Mary Mayhem. If this is the case, then Superwoman would still be an evil Wonder Woman and Olympiad would be representing an evil Donna Troy. Nerds! Nerd! Nerd! Mary Bromfield appears at the end of the episode The Power of Shazam and is reunited with her brother Billy Batson on the animated series Batman Brave and the Bold from the year. 2010. Both Mary Batson and Mary Marvel are featured in the Batman the Brave and the Bold episode titled The Malicious Mr. Mine from the year 2011. Mary Bromfield would be reintroduced yet again in the year 2012 as part of DC Comics's New 52 initiative. Her first appearance is within the Shazam backup strip inside the pages of Justice League issue number 8 from the year 2012. In the year 2013, Mary Bromfield finally transforms into Lady Shazam as a member of the Shazam family within the pages of Justice League issue number 21. It's important to note that the Lady Shazam version in both the feature film and current era DC Comics has never been revealed to be Billy's sister by blood, only another in a long line of foster siblings that make up the Shazam family kids. In the year 2013, Mary Bromfield can be seen along with other Shazam family kids in the direct-to-video animated feature Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox. Lady Shazam makes a number of non-speaking appearances as a background character in the DC Superhero Girls web series from the year 2015, and direct-to-video movies such as DC Superheroes Intergalactic Games from the year 2017. A few months prior to the release of the 2019 feature film led to some corporate synergy where Mary Bromfield is regularly featured as Lady Shazam in the ongoing DC Universe Shazam title. Finally, Mary Batson appears alongside a rather thin Uncle Dudley at the end of the film Lego DC Shazam Magic and Monsters in the year 2020. Hey sis, not a bad throw for a girl. BFFs forever! Except for her, she has cooties. Hmm. Uh oh, I missed. Not a bad try for a boy. The Kid Superpower Hour with Shazam will return after these messages. We now return to the Kid Superpower Hour. The episode Who's Who at the Zoo treats Dr. Alarog as a longtime reoccurring foe of the Marvel family who wants revenge for having been imprisoned in a cave. On the television series, he comes across like Gorilla Grodd in a lab coat, kind of like if Alan Oppenheimer voiced the X-Men's Beast. However, in his first appearance inside the pages of Special Edition Comics issue number one from the year 1940, he's a gorilla bombarded with scientific intellect to be sure, but he doesn't say much of anything at all. He's the right-hand man of the villain Slaughter Slade, whose ultimate ambition is to declare himself president with Dr. Alarog serving as his VP. Ironically, for being in an episode titled Who's Who at the Zoo, Dr. Alarog would never receive an entry in Who's Who, the official directory of the DC Universe. Tell me one thing, Alarog. Why do you do these things? You wouldn't understand. I wanted to be the first gorilla in Who's Who. Okay, I'll have a special one printed up for you. Who's Who at the Zoo. I'll get you for this, you big red cheese. <laughs> Alarog comes across more like a King Kong knockoff than a Gorilla Grodd one in the comic book, who then carries the actual President of the United States to the top of the Washington Monument. Of course, Captain Marvel successfully saves the leader of the free world, but if you think he traps Alarog in a cave and the cartoon is referring to a past comic book adventure, you'd be sorely mistaken. This was Alarog's only comic book appearance and was pre-comics code approval, kids, so he lets Alarog fall to his death and then stuffs him and places him on display in the National Museum. Take that, Man of Steel haters. What? How? Let's just say you underestimated humans. <laughs> Ha ha ha! 
Mr. Mind is introduced only as a commanding voice inside the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 22 in the year 1943. This issue would kick off the first long-running serialized story in comic books titled The Monster Society of Evil. The society, led by Mr. Mind, was comprised of some of Captain Marvel's deadliest enemies who have joined forces under the leadership of Mr. Mind. We first encounter Mr. Mind's true form, that of an alien worm, inside the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number number 26 in the year 1943. In the year 1946, Mr. Mind is sent to the electric chair for his war crimes within the conclusion to the Monster Society of Evil from Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 46 titled The End of Mr. Mind. Upon Mr. Mind's return in Shazam! issue number 2 in the year 1973, the issue promises to eventually reveal how the nefarious earthworm survived electrocution. Later that year, Shazam! issue number 9 reveals Mr. Mind used his master control gene to regenerate a new body from a piece of himself that broke off prior to his electrocution. However, in the year 1977, Shazam! issue number 31 contradicts this explanation, and Mr. Mind states as an alien from another planet, he is, in fact, immune to electric shock. Rather than being killed, Mr. Mind was only placed in suspended animation. When Captain Marvel has a showdown with the latest contender for the world's mightiest mortal title from a character calling himself the Invincible Man inside the pages of World's Finest Comics, issue 257 from the year 1979, it is ultimately revealed that this is a super-powered body that Mr. Mind has transferred his consciousness into to battle the Big Red Cheese one-on-one. The Monster Society of Evil, led by Mr. Mind, returns in a multi-part story arc that actually runs from World's Finest Comics, issue 264, to issue 267 in the year 1980. Friends, roundworms, and caterpillars, lend me your antennas! In the Kid Super Power Hour with Shazam cartoon series, Mr. Mind appears in the episodes The Incredible Shrinking City and The Circus Plot, voiced by the series producer Lou Scheimer, presumably to save a few bucks. In The Incredible Shrinking City, written by Batman the Animated Series alumni Paul Dini, Mr. Mind assembles an army of worms in a plot to take over Fawcett City. In The Circus Plot, Dr. Savannah and Mr. Mind create a quote-unquote magic grid that harnesses the power of the sun in the form of a sunbeam. Typically, he and Dr. Savannah were paired up as partners on the series and came across like the old married couple that Galvatron and Lord Zarek turn into at the end of the Rebirth miniseries on Transformers. What's the greatest power in the universe? Me! Who will rule the galaxy? Me! Slowly but surely, Mr. Mind is reintroduced into the post-crisis landscape inside the pages of Power of Shazam, issue number 12 from the year 1995, when Mary Marvel steps on a worm crawling towards Sinclair Batson's ear. Power of Shazam issue number 13 reintroduces Mr. Mind in his reimagined form, and he spends the majority of the issue speaking in an alien language that could only be translated by using Mr. Mind's Venusian decoder code at the end of the comic book. Mr. Mind ends up taking over the body of Billy's miserly Uncle Ebenezer Batson after his other host vessel, Sinclair, was left a charred husk. When Mind, as Ebenezer Batson, begins running the casino operations in Fawcett City, the pre-crisis visual of Mr. Mind is used as a mascot for Fawcett Casino inside the pages of Power of Shazam issue number 15 from the year 1996. In Power of Shazam 16 and 17, the story would culminate with Mind using mind control on Savannah to launch an invasion by his fellow Worms of Venus. Luckily, Captain Marvel sucks the entire invasion army out into the freezing cold of space, leaving Mind the only survivor back on Earth. After Mind tries to possess the wizard Shazam himself, Captain Marvel finally stops Mind by encasing him in the freezer of an ice cream truck inside the pages of Power of Shazam issue number 18. Similar to his stint as the Invincible Man, in the pages of World's Finest Comics, Mr. Mind designs a construct body to fight Captain Marvel, as well as Mary Marvel, within the pages of Power of Shazam, issue number 40, in the year 1998. Imagine, if you will, that the Doomsday Containment Suit was merely a cocoon armor that made a muscle-bound behemoth, and to explain his claims that Venusian worms wiped out the dinosaurs, Mind erupts from his cocoon armor, growing into a 
a gigantic worm with immense size and power. By the following issue, The Power of Shazam, issue number 41, Mr. Mind goes on a rampage, attacking the White House. However, the gigantic worm attacking the White House all turns out to be an illusion of the mind projected by Mr. Mind, and his cocoon armor is quickly defeated by our heroes. Mr. Mind goes on to become a regular fixture in the best of DC Comics' weekly series titled 52 from the year 2007. In the series penultimate climax, week 51, it is revealed that Mind ate Booster Gold's robot companion Skeets in order to create a chrysalis from which to hatch into some kind of demonic butterfly. The metamorphosis of Mr. Mind nearly leads to the destruction of the newly restored multiverse in week 52. What's happening? I may have misspoken earlier, Survivor, when I said it was the ray's power that would increase 100 fold. Actually, it was mine! In the year 2011, Mr. Mind appears in the animated series Batman, the Brave and the Bold, exceptionally brought to life by the talented Greg Ellis. Fans of Star Trek Deep Space Nine may remember him as the Cardassian soldier Ikor, who joins Legate the Mars Rebellion against the Dominion in the series finale episode, What You Leave Behind. For Cardassia! The titular character in the episode titled The Malicious Mr. Mind. This episode has Mind usurping the leadership of the Monster Society of Evil from Dr. Savannah. When Savannah attempts to betray him by unleashing their death ray on Mind, the crafty Venusian worm reveals it is actually a growth ray and becomes an actual kaiju sized insectoid monster, calling back to both the power of Shazam as well as the weekly 52 series. Mind's next animated appearance would come in the 2017 episode of the outstanding Justice League action cartoon. In the episode titled Follow That Space Cab, he appears as an intergalactic fugitive who is tracked down by the bounty hunter Lobo. In the year 2019, Mr. Mind and Captain Marvel appear in the fifth season of Teen Titans Go! in the episode titled Little Elvis. Oh my goodness gracious! That little boy is about to fight that worm! It don't get no better than this, y'all! It don't get no better! Mr. Mind makes his feature film debut in the feature film Shazam from the same year. He makes a brief cameo in the very beginning of the film as a prisoner of the Rock of Eternity. Then, by the end of the film, in the post credit sequence, he comes to the jail cell of Savannah to form an alliance. Oh, what fun we're going to have together. The Seven Realms are about to be ours. Ibak, the accursed King of Evil, makes his first appearance inside the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 8 from the year 1942. When small-time crook Stanley Stinky Print Whistle says the magic word Ibak, he is powered by the wickedness of Earth's most vile villains, Ivan the Terrible, Caesar Borgia, Attila the Hun, and Caligula, whose initials comprise the name Ibak. Stanley Print Whistle would later return as the reformed janitor within the pages of Shazam, issue number four, from the year 1973. However, the evil spirits that comprise the powers of Ibak, Ivan the Terrible, Caesar Borgia, Attila the Hun, and Caligula force Print Whistle to say the magic word once again to become Ibak the Cursed. Aunt Minerva, who you'll remember we covered in some detail on the segment for the Legends of the Superheroes TV special, ends up having a thing for Ibak inside the pages of Shazam, issue number 29 from the year 1977. Ibak is so aghast that he transforms back into the meek and scrawny Stanley print whistle just to avoid her quote-unquote affections. Stop right there, young man. But I have to go help a friend. You're not going anywhere uh, until this dormitory uh, is spotless. Ibak only appears in the Filmation cartoon as the Emperor of the Hissmen in the episode titled Best Seller. There's no real reference to the origin of his superpowers or even an attempt to revert Ibak back into Stanley Stinky Print Whistle. Depending on which version of his origin story you read, from Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 8 or Adventure Comics issue 491, either Prince Lucifer or Satan himself grant Ibak his vile, villainous powers. In these initial 
initial appearances, Prince Lucifer comes across to me as fairly harmless, kind of like the version of the devil from the Looney Tunes cartoon. However, in subsequent appearances from Adventure Comics 491 and 492 in the year 1982, the creepy, satanic aspects from titles such as Ghost Rider and Tomb of Dracula appear to have crept into the tone of the comic book story titled The Confederation of Hell. You won't go far, fools. The post-crisis interpretation of Ibak makes his first appearance inside the pages of The Power of Shazam, issue number one from the year 1995. Here, Ibak is reimagined as a terrorist thug who has a tattoo on his chest of the demoness known as Blaze from the Superman titles of the era. In the post-crisis era, the wizard Shazam is actually revealed to be the father of the brother and sister pair of Lord Satanus and Blaze. By issue number three of The Power of Shazam, we learn that Ibak's true identity is still that of crook Stanley Stinky Print Whistle. Later in the issue, Ibak attempts to abduct Mary Bromfield and her nanny, Sarah Prim, but Captain Marvel arrives on the scene to end those plans. Even Aunt Minerva returns in Power of Shazam issue number 21 from the year 1996. She is reimagined as Lady M, the head of an illegal gambling ring who uses a skin treatment called Neoderm to maintain a youthful beauty mask. Success. Ibak makes an appearance as a member of the Monster Society of Evil in the Batman The Brave and the Bold episode titled The Malicious Mr. Mine from the year 2011. Ibak is briefly mentioned by Cat Grant during a televised news report in the Young Justice episode titled Misplaced from the year 2012. Today in Fawcett City, Captain Marvel defeated an attack by the creatures known as Ibak and Sabak. Ibak is re-envisioned yet again in DC Comics' New 52 initiative. In the time of the second millennium BC, a brutal barbarian king known as Ibak I becomes the brutal ruler of Kondok. He is ultimately turned into stone by Black Adam, while the puppet dictator who takes his name in present day is swiftly slaughtered within the pages of Justice League of America issue number 7.4 from the year 2013. Finally, in the year 2014, Billy Batson runs into a more classic version of Ibak on the way home from a scary movie in the DC Nation short Shazam titled Courage. I told you you'd be back. <laughs> The Hiss Men make their first appearance on the cover of Marvel Family, issue number 74 from the year 1952. Not to be confused with the Crocodile Men from the planetoid Punkus, who serve Mr. Mind as agents of the Monster Society of Evil, nor the foes that challenge Hawkman in his seventh issue in the story titled Attack of the Crocodile Men from the year 1965, The Hiss Men from Marvel Family, issue number 74, who are featured in the episode titled Best Seller, are pretty faithfully adapted from the original comic book story. In the animated series, Ibak the Accursed teams up with the Hissmen, giving Freckles Marvel a rare book which serves as a portal for the Hissmen to enter the Marvel Mansion. The Hissmen proceed to gag and bound Freddy, Mary, and Billy, kidnapping them before they can use their magic words to transform into the Marvel family. Then when the kids are placed into the quote-unquote people processor, they themselves are transformed into Hissmen, just like the original comic book. Unfortunately, as Hissmen, even though they aren't gagged, they are unable to transform into the Marvel family. Molly. Although the means by which the Hissmen arrive is a bit different from the original comic, when the kids attempt to escape in their Hissmen forms, they quickly find themselves 10 million years in the past within a prehistoric jungle among carnivorous dinosaurs. Also, the Hissmen of the comic book are so fanatical that when faced with capture, one of them shoots the other and turns the gun on himself to avoid revealing any intel. Eventually, Ibak plants the time tube that was used in the comic book in the back yard of the Marvel Mansion. Although simply going through the time tunnel does not change Billy back to his normal human appearance on the cartoon, he is able to say his magic word and transform into Captain Marvel. Unfortunately, only Billy Batson can go back through the time tunnel, which replicates the original sequence of how the Marvel family was captured in the comic book. 
Luckily, Uncle Marvel, Freckles Marvel, and Tawny arrive to take away Billy's gag so that he can save the day as Captain Marvel. Ibak is then left to his own devices to fend off the carnivorous dinosaurs of 1 million BC. Somehow, I have a feeling we won't be seeing him again for a while. The Crocodile Men are humanoid crocodiles from the planet Punkus who are members of Mr. Mind's Monster Society of Evil. Created by Otto Binder and C.C. Beck, Crocodile Man first appears unnamed inside the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 22 in the year 1943. Although still unnamed later that year, Jork the Crocodile Man makes his first appearance inside the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 27. By issue number 30 of Captain Marvel Adventures, the very same suited Crocodile Man appears and is introduced by Mr. Mind as Jork of the planet Punkus to his Axis associates. I didn't want to leave the swamp, you know, but he didn't care. No one understands me. <laughs> Although also unnamed, both Herkimer and Sylvester appear as agents of Mr. Mind's Monster Society of Evil within the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 38 in the year 1944. Two of the Crocodile Men are Christian Sylvester and Marmaduke inside the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 40. By issue number 43 of Captain Marvel Adventures, the third Crocodile Man is Christian Herkimer, assistant leader of the Monster Society of Evil. Similar to his appearance on the Filmation cartoon in the episode episode titled The Circus Plot, Herkimer would later reform in the comics, joining a traveling circus inside the pages of Shazam, issue number two in the year 1973. Even though the character is not referred to as Herkimer by name on the cartoon, since the episode was written by Batman the Animated Series alumni Paul Dini, I'm fairly certain the intent was to feature the character in a cameo appearance. Go out there and sing. In the year 2011, a crocodile man appears in the animated series Batman the Brave and the Bold in the episode titled The Malicious Mr. Mind. A group of crocodile men playing cards have a cameo appearance in the Shazam feature film from the year 2019. A crocodile man also appears as part of Mr. Mind's Monster Society of Evil in the film Lego DC Shazam Magic and Monsters in the year 2020 and in the current ongoing post DC Rebirth era Shazam comic, the crocodile men are reimagined as a three-headed monster. Awaken, Sobek. However, my favorite moment with a crocodile man came with the character called Sobek in DC Comics' weekly series titled 52 that began in the year 2006. The character is introduced as a harmless talking pet to the character Osiris, a member of the Black Marvel family who has been granted similar powers to Black Adam as his brother-in-law. You are led to believe Sobek is the Black Marvel's counterpart to Talkie Tawny, a crocodile given personification, always hungry for a snack, and a steadfast and loyal companion to Osiris. But by week 43 in the year 2007, Osiris has come to a crossroad in his life when he decides to give up his powers forever as penance for killing a man. Even if it means he will no longer be able to walk, Sobek encourages him to do so. You continue to believe that this encouragement comes from their strong friendship, but instead this takes a twisted turn where Sobek feasts upon his so-called friend. I loved this ending so much when it came out. Slapping myself in the forehead, of course a cross crocodile would eat a human, but at the time, I was so wrapped up in Sobek's charade as a lovable talkie tawny personification that I never saw it coming. One of the only of what I consider modern era comic books that's been able to impact me as an adult the same way comic books in the era of my youth had. On the Filmation cartoon, Mary Marvel can be seen tackling a gigantic beast who represents the Egyptian god of crocodiles, Sobek. The creature was animated into existence by Black Adam's bride-to-be, Princess Jemai, in the episode titled Black Adam's Return. So long, Toothy. Black Adam first appears within the pages of the Marvel Family issue number one in the year 1945. Black Adam is an ancient Egyptian named Teth Adam, who is chosen by the wizard Shazam as his champion. When Teth Adam says the magic word Shazam, 
He is transformed into Mighty Adam, a super-powered being possessing the same powers of Captain Marvel. The episode titled Black Adam's Return is quite faithful to his first appearance from Marvel Family issue number one. It details how the wizard Shazam banished Black Adam to the farthest star and that Black Adam has simply been flying back to the planet Earth for the last 5,000 years. I sensed an evil so strong it could mean only one thing, the return of Black Adam. Adam. Unlike the original comic story, when the Marvel family encounter Black Adam, he is searching for the Princess Jemai to be his bride. The comic goes into much more detail on Black Adam's power corrupting him and how he snaps the neck of the Pharaoh in order to rule as Pharaoh himself. In the episode, Black Adam is seen using a gas pellet on Captain Marvel Jr. that turns him into a creature honoring the deity Anubis. Once the wizard Shazam restores Junior to his normal appearance, the Marvel family stake out the museum where the mummy of Princess Jemai is on exhibit to find Black Adam conducting a magical ritual to resurrect his bride-to-be. Once restored, we quickly learn that Black Adam doesn't appear to be the one who wears the pants in this particular relationship. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get going. Yes, yes, sir, of course. I can't believe it. He's really afraid of her. Gad Zoops, if she's wickeder than he is, we're in trouble. Adam also uses his magic to enlarge and animate the statue of a lion on display named after the ancient Egyptian deity Thoth, while Princess Jemai animates a hieroglyphic of the previously mentioned Egyptian god of crocodiles, Sobek. After the Marvel family dispose of the creatures, they use the staff of Osiris to head into a final confrontation in Egypt with Black Adam and Princess Jemai. You paid for your meddling, you big red ape. We'll see who pays for what. Once the staff of Osiris has been destroyed, Princess Jemai is out of the picture, and Black Adam is looking to trade up to a newer model. The smart elf girl is much prettier than Jemai. How would you like to be my queen? Black Adam then calls upon the power of the Egyptian jackal god Anubis to stop the Marvel family in their tracks. With Princess Jemai out of the picture, Adam hypnotizes Mary Marvel into becoming his new queen and uses ice vision to trap Captain Marvel and Junior. The ice traps don't hold them for long, and they trick Adam into saying the magic word Shazam by planting a scroll with the word written on it in a treasure chest in space. In Marvel Family issue number one, it's actually Uncle Dudley who tricks Black Adam into saying the magic word. In my mind, there's no small sense of irony that Black Adam has all of one single solitary appearance in the entire Fawcett Comics publication. Arguably one of Captain Marvel's most popular and frequent opponents, but before the Fawcett Comics characters were licensed and then acquired by DC Comics, Black Adam's original ultimate fate is to say the magic word and turn into a pile of dust, never to be seen again. The minute he said the magic word... He was automatically transformed back into his mortal form. Since he was a 5,000-year-old Egyptian, his mortal form had become dust. Once DC Comics started the Shazam title back up, the origin story for Marvel Family issue number one is reprinted in Shazam issue number eight from the year 1973. Shazam issue number 28 from the year 1976 sees the return of Black Adam by way of Dr. Savannah's reincarnation machine. Writer E. Nelson Bridwell, never one to run away from making his comic book continuity spick and span, would clarify that while Captain Marvel's abilities were derived from ancient Greco-Roman deities, Black Adam's powers came from the ancient Egyptian deities. S for the stamina of Shu, god of air and sky. H for the strength of Hershef, the Egyptian Hercules. A for the strength of Amon, king of the gods. Z for the wisdom of Zahuti, god of wisdom. A for the speed of Anpu, conductor of the dead. And M for the courage of Menthu, god of war. The post-crisis interpretation of Black Adam's origin in the miniseries Shazam the New Beginning sees the strength of Hershef replaced with the swiftness of Heru, god of the sky. Guy. The strength of Amon exchanged for the power of Atan, god of the sun, and the courage of Menthu traded for the courage of Mehen, god of snakes. Mehen admires your courage. I have the strength of Hercules, and I the strength of Amon. Amon's strength overpowers you. By Atan you will die. 
Shazam! The New Beginning from Roy Thomas and Tom Mandrake features the first post-crisis appearance of Black Adam. In this iteration of the story, Billy is granted the powers of Captain Marvel by the wizard Shazam to fight his greatest nemesis, Black Adam. Unlike his pre-crisis and cartoon origins, Black Adam is banished by the wizard Shazam to another dimension and returns to Earth by way of Dr. Savannah's dimensional transportation machine. Black Adam actually returns on the Filmation cartoon in the episode titled A Little Something Extra. No explanation is provided by writer Paul Dini for how Black Adam returned after being left a pile of ash from the previous episode. Black Adam's plot this time involves transporting the Marvel family back to ancient Egypt and to use a magic potion that dissolves the riverbeds of the 20th century. After the Marvel family defeat the lava monsters conjured by Black Adam, Mary Marvel tricks Black Adam into saying the magic word Shazam. However, instead of turning into a pile of dust, in this episode he simply fades away and gets sent back into time. When he said Shazam, he was transformed back into his mortal form. And his mortal form lived 5,000 years ago. Sure, Jan. Since both Swiftwin and Black Adam were voiced by Filmation head honcho Lou Scheimer, my good buddy Huey Toonmore wouldn't let me go without pointing out that She-Ra's Flying Steed and Captain Marvel's greatest nemesis have the same voice in common. But somehow I just can't see Black Adam as She-Ra's personal uber. <laughs> I am swift win now, dear friend. Well then, I stand corrected. Black Adam and Swiftwin, secret brothers! Black Adam does as he pleases. Outside of the DC comic event titled War of the Gods, and the tie-in from Suicide Squad issue number 58 in the year 1991, Black Adam would not appear again until his reinterpretation in Jerry Ordway's Power of Shazam graphic novel in the year 1994. In the graphic novel, Black Adam is reinterpreted as the unscrupulous archaeological aid Theo Adam. Looking a bit inspired by Boris Karloff on an archaeological dig financed by the Savannah Foundation to excavate the tomb of Ramesses II, Theo betrays and murders C.C. and Marilyn Batson. Who is Black Adam, sir? And how is he so powerful? After Theo first encounters Captain Marvel, he eventually comes to the realization that the scarab he stole from the dig all those years ago could grant him the power of Black Adam. Black Adam is eventually stopped by Captain Marvel when he removes the scarab from his neck, turning him back into the sniveling thug Theo Adam. The wizard Shazam then removes his power of speech and memories of Black Adam. Theo Adam would remain locked away in prison until he makes his triumphant return in the ongoing Power of Shazam series. Black Adam allies himself with the demoness Blaze in the Power of Shazam issue number 10 from the year 1995. This issue reveals that Teth Adam was the son of the pharaoh Ramesses II and was later seduced to the ways of evil by Blaze. The wizard Shazam then removed his mighty powers with the scarab, which turned him into a corpse that was entombed as Kem Adam. In Power of Shazam issue number 11, Black Adam continues to carry out Blaze's will by ripping apart the talking tawny stuffed animal belonging to Mary Marvel. By issue number 12, we find out that Black Adam is only working with Blaze because she holds the soul of Theo Adam's sister, Sarah Prim Hostage. However, Mary Marvel and Blaze's dark brother, Lord Satanus, enable Sarah Prim to overcome her guilt and move on to the heavens. At the climax of the conflict, Black Adam is locked within the center of the Rock of Eternity along with Blaze herself. Think of something cheerful like beating the slaves while they build the pyramids. In the year 1998, the final page of The Power of Shazam issue number 44 sees Black Adam freed from his mystical prison. Power of Shazam issue number 45 features a battle between Black Adam and the Morrison era JLA, and at the conclusion of the fight, Black Adam agrees to stand trial in order to prove his innocence in the murder of CC and Marilyn Batson. By the Power of Shazam issue number 46, the courts rule that Black Adam and his alter ego, Theo Adam, are two separate personalities and that Black Adam cannot be held accountable for Theo Adam's crimes of murder. Sure, Jan. 
Later in the issue, Black Adam and Savannah plot to free Blaze from the Rock of Eternity, but instead end up unleashing the Three Faces of Evil upon the world. Captain Marvel seals away the Three Faces of Evil within the Rock of Eternity within the pages of The Power of Shazam issue number 47 in the year 1999. This final issue of the original run of The Power of Shazam sees Captain Marvel and Black Adam having one last battle before agreeing that they are, if not the best of friends, at the very least, no longer enemies. You are worthy foes, but I've come too far with my plans to be stopped now. As incredulous as I find the court's ruling, this would usher in a new age for Black Adam as an anti-hero of sorts. Eventually, he would run with the JSA around late 2000 as a member under probationary status. Ultimately, in JSA issue number 45 in the year 2003, Black Adam and his young protege, Adam Smasher, leave the team after the JSA gives in to the terrorist Cobra's demand and allows him to walk free after he threatens to trigger suicide bombers who are his loyal followers protesting outside of the courthouse. In JSA issue number 51, Cobra tries to stave off death, claiming he has a detonator connected to his heart. When it stops, he threatens his headquarters along with half of Manhattan will explode. When this is proven false by Brainwave's telepathy reading, Black Adam swiftly rips out his heart. In the Black Rain storyline from the year 2004, Black Adam takes back his homeland, the nation-state Kondok, from oppressive dictators. Then in the DC Weekly Series 52 from the year 2006, Black Adam would take the stage as a world leader. Over the course of the series, we would witness his highest highs as a proud ruler and patriarch of the Black Marvel family, and his lowest lows, filled with an unquenchable rage after the deaths of his new family. Hi. I killed them. I killed them all. They're dead. Every single one of them. And not just the men, but the women and the children, too. They're like animals, and I slaughtered them like animals. The name Teth Adam is briefly mentioned during a flashback in the episode of Justice League Unlimited titled Ancient History, also from the year 2006. Victory! The land of Kondok has been freed from Octon's rule and placed under your benevolent protection. As tribute, Teth Adam sends 100 of the finest stallions on Earth. Although you'd think giving the mass murderer who started World War III in the DC Universe his own title would be a tough sell, the miniseries Black Adam, The Dark Age was released in the year 2007. By comparison, the all-ages title Billy Batson and the Magic of Shazam went back to somewhat of a more lighthearted take on the characters, with Black Adam influencing Freddie Freeman to become Black Adam Jr. in the year 2010. In the same year, the wonderful animated series Batman the Brave and the Bold featured Black Adam in the the episode titled The Power of Shazam. Adam is summoned to the planet Earth after his 5,000 year long exile by Thaddeus Bodog Savannah. You dare summon me? No! I should crush you, mortal. There is also a reference to Black Adam in the season 10 Smallville episode titled Isis. A nameplate in the Metropolis Museum reads Dagger of Teth Adam. Black Adam battles both Captain Marvel and Superman in the short DC Universe animated film titled Superman Shazam The Return of Black Adam. Post-Flashpoint, Black Adam's introduction as part of the DC comic New 52 Initiative takes place inside the pages of Justice League issue number 10 from the year 2011. Black Adam would go on to make yet another animated appearance as a member of the Injustice League in the Young Justice episode titled Revelation. In the year 2016, Black Adam appears as the primary antagonist in the premiere episode of the fantastically fun Justice League action episode titled Shazam Slam. Black Adam returns in the DC Rebirth era of comics within the pages of Shazam issue number four in the ongoing saga titled Shazam and the Seven Magic Lands in the year 2019. Black Adam makes a cameo appearance as a member of the Legion of Doom in the unspeakably oblivious DC Universe animated series Harley Quinn in the episode titled LOD RSVP from the year 2020. Finally, in that same year, Black Adam also makes an obligatory appearance at the climax of the film Lego DC Shazam Magic and Monsters. You. So, the wizard found a new errand boy. Come, 
Come show me what you have! Night Owl, not to be confused with the character of the same name from Moore and Gibbons' Watchmen, first appears in Mary Marvel issue number 24 in the year 1948. His eyes have superhuman vision in the darkness, but he is essentially blind in the daytime. Mostly serving as an opponent for Mary Marvel, he's kind of a cross between the Claw King from Batman the Animated Series and Daredevil's arch foe, the Owl. The voice modulator used on the episode titled The Airport Caper and the vocal filter Reminds me of how Filmation achieved the strange sound for the evil horde villain Mantana on She-Ra, Princess of Power. Mm, we should destroy the village. At least then we'd have some fun. Say, anyone tell you you look a lot like a, a bird? Everybody's a comedian. Oh, but this joke will be on them. Hey, I found my identification! His invention, called the Dark Flash, emits a ray of pitch black darkness where Night Owl can see, but the victims of his crimes cannot. Night Owl would return in the pages of Shazam issue number 12 from the year 1974, but this was a reprint of his original appearance from Fawcett Publications' Mary Marvel issue number 24. Wait till Captain Marvel gets in the way of my Dark Flash! <laughs> Night Owl's modus operandi on the Filmation cartoon involves stealing a gold shipment and some rare tiger cubs while using his dark flash on airport security and his night vision goggles to carry out the deed under a state of pitch black. Meanwhile, the Marvel family are busy controlling air traffic gone haywire, and when the city officials refuse to pay his ransom for the stolen tiger cubs, Night Owl resorts to using his dark flash generator to put all of Fawcett City in a blanket of darkness. Night Owl, that beady-eyed bandit. In the post-crisis series, Power of Shazam, the sixth issue makes reference to Fritz, a radio broadcaster at WHIZ Radio who is known as the Night Owl. Superman would later give a public announcement to Fawcett City on Night Owl's WIZ radio show during the Final Night crossover issue of Power of Shazam, issue number 20. By issue number 33 of Power of Shazam, Nick Bromfield mentions to young Billy Batson that when he had blemishes as a young lad, he disguised them under a pair of dark glasses that put your old radio friend Fritz the Night Owl to shame. Starmaster would appear to be one of the few original villains created for the Filmation series. In the episode titled Starmaster and the Solar Mirror, the Starmaster is an evil alien being who threatens the Earth with destruction if the United Nations does not surrender the planet to his rule. Starmaster's vessel reminds me a lot of the Martian spaceships from the 1953 classic War of the Worlds. Star Master perpetuates an unnatural eclipse of the sun, leaving the people of Earth to freeze. When Mary Marvel and Captain Marvel Jr. are captured by Star Master's ice rays, Captain Marvel teams up with the students from Hero High to stop Star Master from freezing all of New York City and destroying the Earth. Captain Marvel would later return the favor, guest appearing in the Hero High episode titled A Fistful of Knuckles. You're the one who needs a good lesson, Star Master. Captain Marvel! Haven't you ever heard of knocking? One of my all-time favorite Captain Marvel villains, Mr. Atom, makes his first appearance in Captain Marvel Adventures issue number 78 in the year 1947. The metal marauder is brought to life by scientist Dr. Charles Langley and quickly comes to the realization that with his great strength, he could rule the world. Mr. Atom is kind of like an evil Jet Jagger, or the Avengers villain Ultron, an evil super-powered robot bent on world domination. When I finish these robots, the human race will be my servants. 
I'll be master of the world. In the eponymously titled episode of the Filmation cartoon, Mr. Adam the Smasher, Mr. Adam plans to take over the world using a secret robot army he builds at Zap Electronics. Similar to his first appearance, Mr. Adam wants the United Nations to declare him master of the world. While I enjoy the epic battles between Captain Marvel and Mr. Adam, I think my favorite story featuring Mr. Adam would have to be the world's mightiest race from Shazam issue number 33 from the year 1977. It's a fun little story from E. Nelson Bridwell, which came out about a week before I was born. This time, the face-off between Captain Marvel and Mr. Adam is essentially Hanna-Barbera's wacky races on the Indianapolis 500. Mr. Mind rescues Mr. Adam from hurtling through space as a result from a previous Justice League story. So, in the world's mightiest race, Mr. Adam is acting as an agent of Mr. Mind and uses his own head to power a race car called the Adam Mobile. If the Atommobile is not defeated by a challenging race car, then it will flood the city with radiation. Captain Marvel then talks to the Elders and decides to build his own Shazam-mobile to enter into the race. Powered by the magic word Shazam, it has the same durability as Captain Marvel and lightning nitro speed to boot. Well, I'm atomic. Nothing will stop me. The post-crisis version of Mr. Adam makes his first appearance in Power of Shazam, issue number 23 from the year 1996. This interpretation of the character sees the Adam as the misguided creation of scientist Dr. Charles Langley, seeking female companionship for his long-dead creator. By 1998, Power of Shazam, issue number 38, kicks off the post-crisis monster society of evil art, which sees the Mr. Adam robot triggering a nuclear explosion in the Batson's hometown of Fairfield. As a point of suspense, you are led to believe this explosion kills Billy and Mary's adoptive parents, Nick and Nora Bromfield, along with the entire town. While it appears, initially, that Sarge Steele and the U.S. government are the ones controlling Mr. Adam, it's actually Mr. Mind who is controlling Sarge Steele from behind the scenes. While still a Coast City-level event, thankfully, the following issue reveals that Nick and Nora Bromfield are actually still alive when they got on the interstate after Billy's JLA device began to signal. For the last time, you big red cheese! Are you going to let me by, or do I press the button? Mr. Adam is one of the few members of the Monster Society of Evil, other than Mr. Mind and Savannah, that has a speaking role on the Batman Brave and the Bold episode titled The Malicious Mr. Mind from the year 2011. Although the weekly DC Comics Series 52 does it first, as the multiverse is restored, the delightful all-ages comic book titled Billy Batson and the Magic of Shazam envisions Adam as a gigantic mecha that towers over city skyscrapers along the lines of popular Japanese tokusatsu and daikaiju pictures. Attempting to up the cool factor on the magical realms of Shazam, Mr. Adam also appears as a member of the post-DC Rebirth era Monster Society of Evil, who hails from the magical game lands in Shazam issue number 11 in the year 2020. From my perspective, this reinterpretation of Mr. Adam appears to be influenced by the Zeit Geist of the book and the film Ready Player One, and I look forward to seeing him as a solo operator outside of the shadow of his Monster Society teammates. You must admit, Savannah, Mr. Mind's interpretation of the Death Ray is far more impressive than your original design. Of course, a dim bulb like you would be lured in by fancy bells and whistles, but will it work? While we've covered some of the history of the world's maddest scientist, Dr. Savannah, on previous installments of this series, the Savannah family is brand new territory for history of comics on film. But to get to the Savannah family, we need to start with Beautia. Empress of Venus, who makes her first appearance inside the pages of Wiz Comics issue number three from the year 1940. In the following issue of Wiz Comics, she not only makes the cover, but is described within the issue as a quote-unquote fellow conspirator 
of Savannah. However, by Wiz Comics, issue number 14, Beautia sobs to Captain Marvel that she has a secret which she's hesitant to reveal. The first real notion of Savannah having a family comes at the conclusion of Wiz Comics issue number 15 inside the story titled The Origin of Savannah. With this issue, we learn that Savannah built a rocket ship and raised his two children on the planet Venus. Those two children were the adversaries Captain Marvel faces in this issue, Beautia and Magnificus. The animated series never focused on Beautia or Magnificus, but there were appearances from the children of Savannah's second marriage, Georgia Savannah and Savannah Jr. In the episode titled A Menacing Family Affair, Dr. Savannah, Georgia Savannah, and Savannah Jr. attack Fawcett City in a giant nuclear-powered Megazord like their Power Rangers before they're defeated by Captain and Mary Marvel. Georgia! Junior! Double the power! Let's hit that big red cheese with everything we've got! The world's wickedest girl, Georgia Savannah, first appears inside the pages of Mary Marvel, issue number one from the year 1945, in the story titled Mary Marvel Meets Savannah's Daughter, Georgia. Even though she may take after her father in the looks department, at least Ibak is still sweet on Georgia Savannah within the pages of Shazam, issue number 14 from the year 1974, in the story titled The Evil Return of the Monster Society. Hello, and goodbye, you little red cheesecake! Oh! <laughs> Savannah Jr. first appears in the year 1946 within the pages of Captain Marvel Adventures, issue number 52, in the story titled The Son of Savannah. After Savannah Jr.'s first appearance, they would amp up the rivalry between him and Captain Marvel Jr. In Captain Marvel Jr., issue number 35 from the year 1946, Savannah Jr. would make his first cover appearance, and by the following issue, Savannah Jr. would actually battle Captain Marvel Jr. within the pages of the comic book. Ultimately, the Savannah family, as we know them in the Filmation cartoon, would come together in Marvel Family issue number 10 from the year 1947 in the story titled The Savannah Family Strikes at the Marvel Family. Ah, nothing's working, Pop! He's the system. According to Who's Who, the definitive directory of the DC Universe, Savannah is a widower twice over, so that just kind of makes me wonder, who is cray-cray enough to marry and procreate with Dr. Savannah? Who let Savannah put his dick inside them to get these two ugly cusses? While there's no real explanation as to who the mothers of Savannah's children are in pre-crisis history, post-crisis history does attempt to provide some answers to this question. Although the story titled The Tenants of Time in The Power of Shazam issue number 27 from the year 1997 is a divergent timeline, we see the moment where Savannah's first wife leaves him. In a nod to the classic Golden Age stories from Wiz Comics, she's named after the planet Venus. Unbelievably, Savannah, ever the playa, even makes reference to the quote-unquote other woman who meant nothing to him as she takes Beautia and Magnificus away with her in a taxi cab. It's never stated outright, but perhaps this dalliance outside of Venus's loving embrace led to Georgia and Junior's conception? For a long while, it was assumed that Georgia and Junior were relegated to the pre-crisis memories of the Psycho Pirate. However, Georgia and Junior would make their post-crisis debut in DC Comics' weekly event series 52 by week number 26 in the year 2006. Even the previously mentioned Lady Savannah, again going by the name Venus, appears with the entirety of the Savannah family, save the missing Savannah himself, living under one roof. Watch out, Mary Marvel! Let me at that punk, Captain Marvel Jr. <laughs> now we do indeed! 
did have the power to beat those miserable marvels at their own game. After their defeat in the opening sequence of the cartoon, the Savannah family managed to escape while the Marvels are busy sending their self-destructing robot into space. When an alien spacecraft lands outside of their hideout, the Savannahs receive an amulet that grants them superpowers and abilities that are equivalent to the Marvel family. This, of course, leads to an epic battle royale, a Marvel and Savannah family feud, if you will. The Savannah's acquiring superpowers doesn't end with the Filmation cartoon either. Savannah manages to siphon off Captain Marvel's powers in the DC Comics Presents Annual Number 3 from the year 1984, titled With One Magic Word. He then proceeds to take on both the Earth 2 and Earth 1 incarnations of Superman. Of course, the running gag is that Savannah continually promotes himself from Captain to Major to Colonel to General Savannah. General? Would you care to step outside? In the Batman The Brave and the Bold episode titled The Power of Shazam from the year 2010, Savannah, along with his children, Junior and Georgia, team up with Black Adam to steal the power of Shazam. However, Savannah betrays Black Adam and steals the powers, calling himself Captain Savannah. Kids, your father is a genius. What did you find, Daddy? It's probably no coincidence that the color scheme for Captain Savannah is later duplicated in the current DC Universe Shazam title when Billy's father, CC Batson, possessed by Mr. Mind, is granted the power of Shazam. What? That little runt is Captain Marvel? Gross! The notion of the entire Savannah family getting superpowers would be revisited within the pages of The Multiversity Thunderworld Adventures, issue number one from the year 2014. Not only does it give him superpowers to battle the world's mightiest mortal, but Georgia Savannah has also transformed, butterflied, blossomed into the latest thoughty sensation on the interwebs. Meanwhile, Savannah himself transforms into a hulkling creature calling himself Black Savannah. In addition, they also kind of amalgamated Black Adam with Savannah from the DC Comics New 52 initiative in the 2019 Shazam feature film. Arguably, the version of Savannah with the most mass exposure, the one from the 2019 film, has magical powers from the Eye of Sin and the Seven Sin. I hate to admit it, but the Savannahs have acquired powers as strong as ours. I never actually saw the Kid Superpower Hour with Shazam when it aired on television, but I certainly remember bringing oversized VHS tape boxes of Filmation's Shazam up to the rental counter with me at what was formerly Cone's Video in Fremont, California. This series, along with Filmation's Batman, would form the building blocks of what would eventually become He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. I truly believe that the folks they got to write and animate this series had a love and passion for the source material that shines through and makes revisiting each episode a lot of fun. If you're a fan of Captain Marvel in the original Fawcett comics, you should definitely check this series out. Come, my children, our work here is finished.
goodness gracious, that little boy is about to fight that worm. It don't get no better than this, y'all. It don't get no better.